All right, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on making yourself competitive in tourism and economic development funding. That is a mouthful, but hopefully we will make it a little easy enough to understand that it won't feel like one. I'm Josh Sheritz with Bull News Marketing. And I'm Jason Ruggiero with Spark Community Capital. And we are excited to have you today. So as we get started here, just a, a couple of things. Um, first, just so you know, we will be sending out the um, slides as well as a couple of things for you. The slides, the recording, and also um, a funding toolkit that we put together with everything from blog posts to um, different information about, about grant funding and whatnot. We'll send the link out to that as well. So anyone who attends the webinar today can get access to that. Um, also, if you have any specific questions, please let us know in the chat um, and Jason or I will do our best to help out. If we don't know the answer, we won't make up one, we promise, um, but we will reach out to you afterwards um, and, and try to, to assist as well as we can with your specific question if it's connected to either a specific grant or, or something more generalized. All right, so a few things as we get started. Um, Everyone is muted, hopefully, except for us. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please chat or type them into the chat feature. And then for your convenience, we will go ahead and read them to the entire group so they know the question and for the context as well as our, our answers. All right, jumping right in. A little bit about us. I'm Josh Schertz at Cohen Bull Moose Marketing. I have about 15, 16 years of experience in both nonprofits and in the heritage tourism field. Um, and um, that is in the marketing end, that is in the fundraising end, that is in the executive director, the CFO, you name it. Um, for better or for worse, if there's a problem with a nonprofit, chances are I've dealt with something similar. Um, sometimes for worse, but we'll see. And then on your, uh, I'm Jason Ruggiero. I'm the owner of Spark Community Capital. Uh, I've spent 10 plus years in uh, government, both local government and then some time in the federal government as well. Uh, I've been focused mainly the last 10 years on grant writing, grant management, grant administration, and project management uh, through the Venango County Planning Commission. Uh, we've done a lot of work in both tourism and economic development and kind of broadly community development uh, as well. All right, and a little bit about what we're going to be digging into today. Um, we'll take a look at including some specific examples of some funding opportunities that are out there, um, especially with everything going on as um, COVID-19 has related funding and two different, what, two different funding bills through Congress that have yeah. put out quite a bit of grant funding. Um, and then you're going to ask, okay, why is a marketing agency co-hosting a webinar on grants? Um, we're going to talk about a, market, a marketing strategy and how that can mean all the difference between getting funds or not getting funds and, and how that can show some success um, in that grant narrative. And then last but not least, Jason's going to really dig into what to know and how to prepare for, for applying for and then administering those grants. So... Here we are, let's dive into some current opportunities. But before that, let's do a quick poll. So there we go. Um, just to help us help you a little bit as we go through this, um, let's launch a bit of a poll. We'd like to know what the one big project you're searching for funding for is. I mean, and obviously there are many of you might have multiple things on your plate. But is it um, marketing current amenities is, um, as a visitor's bureau, what have you, or new amenities? Is it Main Street or downtown um, funding that you're reaching for? Is it economic development projects trying to create those amenities or create that downtown development? What are you, what are you looking for? That might help us tailor some of our presentation to your needs. We'll give you just a minute or two here to fill that in or about 50% or so. Mm -hmm. 
And if it is more than one, feel free to the one that you're looking at specifically. Maybe there's a grant you're currently working on for one of these. About another five seconds or so, and then we'll shut it down. Okay. So we are looking, Jason, we are looking at a fairly decent spread between current amenities, Main Street and downtown funding and economic development. So I think um, the way we have the presentation as it stands should cover all of the above. And then if you need us to stress on anything in particular as we go, feel free to again, throw those questions in the chat box. Share these with you so you can see what we're up to. Someone said other. If there is something other that's, that you're, you'd like us to bring up, again, throw it in the chat box and we'll, we'll help out the best we can. All right. Okay, someone said tourism. So it's, it's that, that marketing of tourist amenities, marketing a, a region location in the sort of a mix between those current and, and new amenities for your area. So let's chat a little bit about a couple of overview um, slides on different kinds of funding. For one, let's chat about heritage tourism. Now let's talk about what heritage tourism is. Many of you think that immediately means history. That is not necessarily the case. Um, we're looking for funding here to attract visitors to experience places, artifacts and activities that represent the people of past and present in your area. So that said, what we're talking is, it could be arts and culture. I, um, it could be the historic nature of your area. It's also natural resources. So this is what makes you, you. What makes your town, your county authentically that, authentically that experience you want people to come and see. Um, is it the downtown? Is it the, the great food? Maybe there's, you're known for a dish you can't get anywhere else or a dish that really was earmarked in that space. Um, it's maybe it's the nature trails, the boating, the local camping, the hunting, the fishing, all of those things, the museums, you name it. It's how those pieces work together. And uh, this is going to, in many cases, also drive funds for continued growth and economic development. So these, these things work hand in hand. We got this great place with this little bit of help over here on the development end, it could even be a greater place. This includes designated state and federal heritage regions and DMOs, over 2,700 um, chambers of commerce, visitors bureaus, et cetera, that um, their, their main goal is to market those regions. Uh, common misperception, grant funding isn't available for tourism, right? Um, in general, unless it's that county line item from your bed tax or whatnot, if you're an organization that has hotel bed tax, um, it is, and especially now. And we'll, as we go forward, we'll chat more about that and, and hear from Jason a bit. On the economic development end of things, let's, we were talking about marketing those amenities, let's talk about building them, developing them, restoring them, rehabilitating them, et cetera, for a higher standard of living in a county, state, or region. Um, this could be new builds. This could be, hey, our downtown, we don't have a hotel. This could be, oh, there's building that's falling down in the center of town, but it is truly like that piece of town that makes us us. Let's figure out a way to turn it into something through adaptive reuse or restore it. Um, it could be even major landscape development in terms of parks. This could, and this is funding that could be municipal, county, town, um, state, et cetera. It could be, you could be a nonprofit, you could be a Main Street program. So this funding for these projects is sought by a number of different, uh, different entities. Um, these kind of projects tend to have a combined component in many cases because some of it is government funds um, through grants, some of it is a match. So sometimes you get that downtown project that has a legacy family that's if you're from your area that's making a donation that helps that match and so forth. So there's, there's, there's complexity here that we can, we can dig into in a little bit. Let's chat about some time sensitive funding. What is there and what is there right now? And largely what is there right now because of COVID? Jason? Yeah, so there are a lot of COVID uh, related grants that are available right now. As Josh said, there's really two different groups. Uh, you know, most of the CARES Act money has been moved out. So that has pretty much been taken care of, but the American Rescue Plan funds are very much still out there. The vast majority have not been spent and they really fall into two or maybe even three different buckets that you wanna look for. One is the American Rescue Plan funds that went directly to the county 
the township, the borough, the city, wherever your project is located, uh, in Pennsylvania, six billion dollars went directly to those entities. And so, if you you know have a project in a city, it's likely that both the city that your project is in and the county that the city is located both got funded to the American Rescue Plan. So you definitely want to check with those entities whether they're interested in funding your project. There's a lot of developing legal opinions about what is eligible. I would not give up on any project as of yet. The final rules are still being drafted by Treasury. Uh, there's a lot of good consulting firms or uh, account, accounting firms, audit firms that can help you get opinions to show that your project is eligible or potentially could be eligible. Uh, there also, though, is a whole batch of federal American Rescue Plan funded programs. Most of them are through the Economic Development Authority, and you see them listed there on the slide. There's the Built Back Better Challenge, the Good Jobs Challenge, the Economic Adjustment Assistance, which is a, a program that has existed for years within EDA, but has gotten a new burst of funding through the ARP. And then what is probably you know, a very attractive pot of money to the people on this webinar, there's an EDA Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Rec funding pot specifically that has $240 million in it in competitive grants. So that's nothing to sneeze at. That's nothing to sneeze at. It is across the entire US. So it will be competitive. But you know, the, the, the crux of our webinar today is to help you put together a competitive application yeah. for that kind of funding. And then I would say, you know, there's there's too many to get specific about, but based on the state that you're in and the uh, specific industry, whether that be heritage, uh, humanities, arts, theater, almost all of those kind of state level groups that are there to assist nonprofits have received money either from the CARES Act or from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, they, they may have got it directly from the state because a whole other batch of ARP funds went directly to the state and then the state turned and handed those out to some of those groups. So if there's a group, you know, if you're interested or, or invested in the humanities, check with the you know, Humanities Council or the Humanities NGO of your state, they may have a whole tranche of funding that is Absolutely. specific to your industry. And some of it, and just speaking from finishing up one of these applications very recently, some of it is um, for bigger projects and some of it, example, the PA Humanities Council is handling some of that right. in, in Pennsylvania. And there's even $20,000 operating grants for nonprofits. So, I mean, some of it has been between CARES and, and ARPA has been earmarked for, for operating funds for, for nonprofit arts and culture organizations. So check out some of those things. That's fantastic. Let's see here. There we go. So let's chat a little bit about, so why on earth are marketing firms talking about grant funding? Um, so part of this is right off the bat, looking at a what a marketing strategy is for your project, for your region, what have you. Um, if you're reaching out for funding, let's example, if it's a brick and mortar project, you have to talk to a contractor. You have to talk to someone and say, hey, what is the plan? Maybe an architect even, what is it, depending on the size of the project, what's it gonna cost? How are we going to do it? Um, same with um, this end of things, because it's so tourism based, um, what are the goals here? Um, smart goals in terms of, um, how are you going to take your, your business goals on this end and what the grant is looking for and tie it into various measures of success? Um, this is also going to unify the grant application in terms of your brand, how your brand is presented, be it a county visitors bureau, be it an economic development authority. What is it that you tell a granting um, organization, we are not just this small group of um, individuals who really would love you to hand us half dollars or a million dollars or five million dollars, whatever. We've got a plan here and we have a plan for success. Um, what are the most impactful tactics here? Um, this is how we're going to reduce spending. This is how we're going to show you long-term success. Um, because you can say, um, I can say to Jason, hey, can you give me $10 million? We're going to build a hotel. Our town needs a hotel. 
his response is going to be, if I hand you $10 million, how can I show that you're going to put people in the rooms in that hotel and you just didn't give build a really great building that's going to be bankrupt in five years? Um, so this is where you show, hey, this is how we're going to market to get people here. This is in my grant narrative. I'm planning on putting together this, this strategy. The strategy is going to draw maybe tenants for this commercial building we're renovating. This is going to draw tourists to the county that I'm trying to push. How, how is that success being shown? Um, how does this contribute to the economic development of your overall area? Shows you how jobs can be created, how revenue can be generated. It's sort of the, instead of the, the, the economic development end is the build it. The, if, um, if you movie fans out there, the build it and they will come for the, I mean, um, this is the, how, how will they come um, end of it. Um, just real quick what this looks like. I mean, you're showing a marketing strategy is basically a four-step process, how you're attracting new visitors to your area or how you're attracting new tenants. This would be attracting them to your materials. How are you differentiating yourself among others? In the tourism end of things, it's not really competition. So we'll, um, we'll say maybe cooperation, if you need to, to make a word. Um, it's how, if you're planning a vacation, how do you get tourists to, to this county versus going somewhere else? This lake versus going somewhere else, this town versus going somewhere else, this amenity. Um, and then how do we make it as easy as possible, be it what you're doing on your website, um, getting information via social media or, or blog posts or what have you. How are you getting those people to you and showing them what you have to offer and then re-engaging? So that said, um, just uh, in terms of the marketing funnel end of things, this is the different tactics and tools as well as what's in that strategy. The tactics and tools on the right are what's actually happening. Are you um, working on your website, social media, what have you. On the left, this is that strategy that you're using as part of your funding is, okay, I'm going to build this and now to get people, we've done the research, we know what kind of people will stay at this, maybe boutique hotel or this, this new restaurant. We're now going to reach out to them. This is how if you give us that $10 million, how we're going to make sure it's invested wisely to make sure that those people are indeed coming to fill those hotel rooms, increase um, your tourist spend in your region, and then find that tenant or customer um, for whatever that development project is. Um, incorporating these things shows that you're being responsible with the funds. You've done your due diligence. Um, that you, it, it shows not just veering slightly from the grant end of things, but not just on the grant end, but also on that, that other flip side of this, when you're reaching out to donors for funding as well, it shows you're serious. Um, example, one project that we're working on right now, um, it was the, the, the strategy behind the marketing, the strategy behind getting the architect, whatnot, it allows us to be able to, to and the, the group people we're working with to tell donors, hey, this got real. Um, so it's, it's, it's time to make that donation happen because it's no longer that dream project. And it also adds a layer of professionalism and polish to what is otherwise the, hi, please give us $10 million. We want to do something nice and we don't have a plan in place. So now we know how we need to present ourselves from the narrative end of things and from the, the polish end of things. How do we actually need to handle applying for those funds? Right, so how do you choose your project and how do you search for funding? So one of the most uh, important pieces of advice that I got when I started writing grants was to make sure you don't work backwards. You need to make a deliberate choice of which project you're pursuing because we all have this. Uh, you don't want me to just say, hey, they're gonna give away free money. I'll invent a project. That's right, because we all have this. Uh, tendency and there's there's a lot of uh lists or mailing lists and things like that out there that every week you know they'll send you a whole list of all the grants that are open and it's really easy to sit with that list get your cup of coffee and start dreaming up projects yes and you might get those projects funded but are those projects actually advancing your plan whether that be your marketing plan your five-year plan, your strategic plan, uh, if you work in local government, maybe your comprehensive plan, because you can get a lot of projects funded and spend a lot of time doing things 
that aren't solving the big problem. And, that, and that's actually what I find tends to happen. You're not solving the big problem. And when you look back, no one's ever solved the big problem because the big problem was hard. Mm -hmm. That's why it was the big problem. Sure. Uh, so, you know, you can't work backwards. The funding stream or streams that are available aren't, aren't the things that should be driving your project choices. Right along with that, it's important to, to remember that success isn't always a new idea. You, you don't have to always dream up a new thing. Uh, a really successful project that I was a part of was a 100% copy of an existing project in a county two hours from here. We went and visited them. We toured their site. We talked to them about what they wish they would have done differently, mm -hmm. the things that went well. And that went a really long way when we finally submitted that grant application. We, we, we weren't just coming up with something new. We were uh, expanding a proven concept. Mm -hmm. And proven concepts are great. Just because you have a problem in your town, uh, someone else probably has that same problem. Sure. And I'm going to guess someone solved it. <laughs> you just need to find them. And then along with it, you know, what are the complementary projects? Because you could come up with kind of a whole ecosystem of, of projects, of initiatives, of marketing mm -hmm. that goes around one project. You know, uh, a community that I work in has a really successful artist relocation program that they started years ago. And they've recruited over 40 different artists to oh, come live, in their, live and work in that community. So now, you know, we should all, the ones that work in that community, be thinking of complementary projects. How do we build upon the fact that we've already got 40 artists here? Mm -hmm. What else can we add to the community? Whether, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be um, art specific, mm -hmm. but what are those people looking for? What could cause them to expand their business? What are ancillary businesses that could come into the community to help those artists succeed? Mm -hmm. uh, moving to the next, uh, how do you develop your project from idea to a submission? Well, the first thing is I call it is closing the circle. So you have to clearly identify what the problem is. Sometimes that can be the hardest part to put into words right there. Right. And the funder wants to know what the problem is. So if you can't put it into words, you're going to have an awful hard time convincing them that you know how to solve the problem. And that's the very second true. part. That's very true. That's closing the circle, right? What is the solution? And how is your project the solution? You need to clearly demonstrate both the problem and how you know the solution. Um, you need to tell that story. Usually with data, visuals are also helpful. But, you know, uh, again, if, if I'm talking about the artist relocation program, talking about the 40 artists that have moved into the community talking about the impact they've made on that community makes it all the more compelling to come up with that ancillary project or that expansion project. Uh, you know, the, the, the project I was referencing earlier that we uh, expanded from, from a neighboring county, we could show the number of students that graduated the program. We could show the number of donors that funded the program. We could show testament letters from businesses of how capable those students were when they came out of the program. Um, those things all help tell the story. And you, know, you can use American Fact Finder, which is a publicly available set of data from the US Census Bureau. And then if you have access to either at your organization or maybe from your county planning office, uh, GIS mapping, that can go a really long way to identifying that problem and telling that story. And then the, the final thing on this slide is to seek good professional help. And I don't mean <laughs> <laughs> that counseling. Is catch right there. And um, the, the good is, the, is often the part that is, that is the, yeah, I'll just let you continue, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, and what, what we mean is uh, cost estimates, mm -hmm. architects, engineers, concept studies, plans, uh, you know, like Josh talked earlier about a hotel. A, uh, we were actually working on a project uh, doing a boutique hotel and 
everyone that we've spoken to as a potential funder is interested in the project, but once we tell them that we have a market study that shows yeah. the location the, 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 is in desperate need of hotel yeah. beds. Hundreds of bed deficits, yeah. It really changes the conversation. It does. It's money well spent. Uh, the same with the cost estimate. Mm -hmm. How do you write a grant without a cost estimate? I've done it, it's not fun. No, and um, it usually requires coming back around and and lots of tightening up later. Right, usually it just shifts all the heartache to the end. And, and, and honestly, what happens is a lot of times when that award letter comes or that award email comes, you're only half-heartedly excited because you know you kind of constructed a uh, house of cards with your cost estimate. You might not be able to do everything you promised with the award that you got. Um, so, you know, cost estimates, renderings, um, grant writing consultants, all those people can really pay for themselves. It, it, it can be a lot of money, uh, especially, you know, the architects, the engineers, things like that. But it, it shows that you're serious. It shows that you're committed to the project. And it shows that people with experience in that field are, are involved and buy into the project as well. Absolutely. Uh, so taking a new risk, versus building on what works. This is kind of a little step to the side, but I think it's really important. I always like to think about my grant application and decide which of these buckets it falls into. Am I taking a new risk or am I building on what works? Because the amount of documentation, mm -hmm. the amount of justification and the type of, of justification, I think really changes based on which one you fall into. You know, taking a new risk, it's always going to require more convincing from the funder. Uh, you know, jobs created, jobs retained, that's the gold standard. And jobs created are always more valuable than jobs retained. Uh, increased tourism, tax revenue, construction jobs, hotel bed stays, you know, whatever you can come up with is, is a huge part of it. And, and don't forget about, uh, especially if you live in, in a state with a state sales tax, if, if, you're, if you're, your project is going to sell something, don't forget about telling the state, especially about the increased sales tax that will come. <laughs> Give me this money. This is how it will benefit you. And right. We, we like to run a little tax calculation off project. You know, what's the sales tax? Uh, if we have jobs created, what's the withholding tax? What's, the, what's all the state income tax? How much money is going to go back to the funder mm -hmm. in the form of tax revenue? Um, but also, again, that's where it's more important when you're talking about a new risk. What's the problem? What's the solution? Closing that circle because you need to convince them that you've got a handle on the situation. Uh, and, the, and then also, you know, your sustainability plan. If you're doing something that's never been done before, yep. like Josh said, yep. how do I know that this $10 million building won't be vacant two years from now? Absolutely. Um, now, if you're doing, uh, if you're building on what works, expanding on a proven concept, you know, then, then that, that's a little easier. Like I said earlier, you can get support letters from, from tenants, students, uh, testimonials from agencies. All of this kind of goes into what I call, or not just my idea, it's, it's an established way of thinking. It's called economic gardening, where it's really, instead of, you know, uh, plowing up new land, you're tending to the garden that your community's already created. So, you know, you've got that employer that maybe has 50, 50 jobs, how do you get them to 60 to 70, up to 100 to 150? Those things always sell better. They always sell better because that business exists. It's paying taxes. It's been a member of the community. It's stable. Uh, you know, if you're going to take a new risk, you really have to beef up your support. That sure. orientation. Sure. Uh, so all this is building up to, you know, actually getting that project to submission, which we'll talk about in the next uh, slide here, and evaluating your project before submission. A little technical glitch, there, there we go. We go. Um, talk your project through with the grant manager. That sounds so simple, so straightforward, but if the first time that the reviewer ever hears of your project is when they open your application, that's generally a bad sign. Uh, one, you may have made some 
unknowing mistakes along the way that mm -hmm. could really bite you in the process. Uh, it's, it's always good to talk it through with the funder. You know, you, maybe you, uh, you have a different definition of some of the words in, in the funding proposal. And so you're actually including ineligible costs. Um, maybe some of your match isn't, isn't eligible. Or the worst case scenario, you're not capturing all the match that you could. Um, I once was part of a project where very deep, deep down in the funding announcement, it said that the match could be waived under special circumstances. And the team I was a part of, we immediately caught onto that, called the funder and said, well, why can't we be the special circumstance? Smart, did it and, work? And it turned out we were the special circumstance and that saved us $500,000 in match. Not bad. So, you know, the worst they can tell you is no. Sure. Well, I'm just quick question, and I haven't seen it come up here, but I'm guessing someone's thinking it right off the bat. If some of this is state or federal funding, um, I'm sure there's a certain amount of hesitancy in some of our some of our attendees mindset, like, wait, you want me to call the state capital and ask to talk to someone that yes. that, that that's 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 they're actually gonna talk to me. So I mean a bureaucrat somewhere is gonna actually answer my questions and, and that that's that's a thing, that's that's doable, <laughs> that's Yes, yes, that is what exactly what I'm asking. Usually somewhere very deep in the uh, funding announcement, there is a phone number. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it has a name attached to it. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I, I've just, you know, I have cold called the Pennsylvania Office of Budget and said, I need someone to talk to me about X. You know, again, you, you can't be afraid of putting yourself out there because you never know what comes out of the project. And, you know, worst case scenario, they tell you your project's not actually eligible. And that's disappointing, but you saved yourself in some cases, all that days time or weeks yeah. <laughs> before you put that application together. They also, a lot of times, are able to help you frame the application better to what the funding priorities are. Mm -hmm. So it's really something, uh, you know, that you want to look at. Uh, it also answers the age old question, because I always ask, how soon will I know? Because we've all put in the grant application and sat there wondering, checking the website, checking our email yeah. refresh over and over again. You got it. Yes, I've been in that spot. Yes. Uh, I always just ask the question, when am I going to know? And a lot of times they try to avoid it, but I will call back mm -hmm. because now I've got a personal relationship sure. with that person. And I'll call that back, you know, not all the time, <laughs> but a few times and say, so how are things going? When are we going to know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we talked about this a little earlier, but before you submit, you have to honestly evaluate mm -hmm. the sustainability of the project. Because as Josh said, these applications can be weeks uh, to put together, take a lot of time. Um, well, and not just your time, but if you are paying consultants or whatnot to help put together, be it prices or what have you, I mean, right spend money on it, it's again that's that's all investment into getting those funds but if if it's not feasible from day one right that's, that's a lot of that's a lot of hoops to jump through for for nothing right so you really got to look at how are you going to sustain yourself after the funding you know can you really get that hotel up and running mm -hmm. can you really get that stem program functioning once the initial investment comes out and of course you know a lot of times that involves shifting from the public support that brought the program online to private support within the community, whether that be businesses, uh, tax credits, or even just private donors, sure. private local foundations as well. So uh, with all that in mind, uh, you know, we've got our project to the finish line and now we're gonna submit the grant. So what are our next steps after submitting? Other than hitting refresh over on, and over on the website, over or just over. calling someone and saying, Hi, can you help? So, one is you got to talk about your project all the time. It's the old uh, adage, you know, fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. The more you talk about the project, the more you insert the project into the community and show everyone that you're serious. And even if this funding stream doesn't come through, you're gonna find another one and another one and another one. And you know that includes uh, site tours, phone calls, office visits. Mm -hmm. And in those site tours, phone calls and office visits, I mean 
that you submitted the application to. Mm -hmm. I mean, congressmen and women. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, state secretaries of economic development, community development, uh, you know, heritage bureaus, whatever that might be. I also, though, mean uh, local planning agencies, nonprofits, whatever your partners are. You know, get yeah. them into the building. Local, local or administration from local colleges, the hosp or local hospitals, right? Those big players in the community that, that sometimes you're like, oh, does, how does that fit? Well, it fits because it makes your community a better place, right? And and it fits because if you can get those people to buy in, they become ambassadors of your project. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, not just helping you find funding. But when the, you know, nasty editorial runs <laughs> about why are we doing this yep. or when it comes up at the hospital board sure. meeting about someone that was doing this, say, yeah, I went and toured that. Actually, it's a great idea. I think it's going to be a great project. It can nip a lot of those things in the bud before they uh, become big, big problems. Absolutely. The other thing is you can't assume that you're going to get your grant. What? <laughs> <laughs> you mean I did all this work, I hit submit, I've been clicking refresh for weeks now, and they're not just going to give me the money? <laughs> they may not, and also they may not give you everything you asked for. That's actually perhaps what I found, you know, if you've done all the legwork, uh, you need to prepare in that interim time of what if I get half of what I asked for? Let me throw a question out that some people might be thinking. Um, does it make sense if it's not, in some cases, I've seen grant applications where it's outright mentioned on here. If you don't receive, if we cannot award you the entire fully fund your project, do you, can you still complete the project, which is kind of code for if we can't give you all of it, can we give you some of it, or is it a waste of our time? Should we just, does it make sense if that's not outlined in there to put right in the grant narrative somehow that we have a plan B if this can be only partially funded or whatnot? Yeah, I like to put in something about, you know, basically how you're not going to stop until the project is funded. Uh, you know, I like to put something about, you know, if we can't, I, I do like to make it somewhat dire though, right? Mm -hmm. like if you can't give me the full amount, I'm gonna have to go back to my architect and spend more money and figure out how to phase the project. And this is going to stretch out the time before I can meet the deliverables or, before you know the students can enroll or whatever it is, I like to make it not a rosy picture mm -hmm. if I don't get fully funded. Sure, but also not. Hey, if you can't do the whole thing, don't even bother because I'll, I'll take anything. Oh, sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, if the goal and and I think that goes back to your original point. Um, don't come up with a project to fit the money. Apply for the money to fit the project. If you're going to do the project, regardless. Right. Partial funding is still partial funding towards the goal. It's not, oh, I made this up off the top of my head. So if you can't give me the whole thing, I wasn't going to do it anyway. So, right. and I think if, if that's, that might be very telling to the grantor, if you say, eh, if I can't do the whole thing with your money, I'm not going to do it. They're right. going to go, well, did they really want to do it in the first place? Or is this just a grab for free money? Right. And I think, you know, some of those professional assistance items we talked about earlier help tell that story too, right? Mm -hmm. After you've invested in the architectural drawings and the renderings and the cost estimate or the landscape plan or yep. whatever, it, it really starts to demonstrate that you're in, you're going to find a way to make this work. And if all they can give you is 100,000, 500,000, you'll take that. Mm -hmm. Um, and oftentimes, you know, they'll work with you on timelines of deliverables and refining the scope and things like that. Um, but you can't assume that you're going to get the full amount. In fact, I would say that you should spend the interim time while your grant is in planning on what happens if you don't get the full amount. Sure. You know, we like to, we like to call that expanding the capital stack. So what are the other sources of capital we could pull in? Um, and along, along with that are uh, items in the last bullet there. Do you really have everything figured into your estimate? Do you have your construction contingency, your soft costs? So that's you know your permit. I just did a project where the I pulled the permit and I had to write a sixty thousand dollar check to the city code office for the building permit. For the building permit, you know. So those are things that you know. Do you have all that covered? What about the uh, 
architectural or engineering fees. Mm -hmm. What about the equipment that actually goes in the building? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, we focus on getting a building constructed. Build a um, hotel with no beds. We, yeah, we build a hotel that doesn't have any beds. It doesn't have any TVs in the rooms. It doesn't have, you know, uh, the kitchen equipment for the continental breakfast. It doesn't, you know, whatever that is. Um, those uh, costs, a lot of times I go to private sources, mm -hmm. like local foundations, private donors, mm -hmm. uh, and tax credits are also good. I mean, if you've got local businesses in your community who are at all interested in funding your project through a straight donation, mm -hmm. you really should be talking to them instead about a tax credit mm -hmm. where they can get something in exchange for their donation. Sure. Um, so local businesses, the successful businesses of your community, especially if the project helps them somehow, mm -hmm. helps them uh, bring in clients, helps them recruit uh, engineers or, you know, some kind of white collar professional uh, job where they're actually headhunting um, amenities that your projects are funding might really help them. They might be very interested in, in helping support. Sure, sure. Um, any adjustment or, or other tidbits here if we're talking more for those those DMOs, those visitors bureaus and some of the grants that they would be looking for that is primarily marketing based. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the beauty of the tax credit is that you can spend the tax credit on anything mm -hmm. because at least the way it's structured in the state of Pennsylvania, um, the money is not coming from the state. Okay. The money that you're getting comes from the business and the business receives a tax credit from the state in return. And so you're getting money that is free of any state regulation, free of the restrictions of any grant program. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted to spend that on marketing, if you wanted to spend that on uh, promotional activities, you, you could spend tax credit dollars on anything mm -hmm. because it comes to you free of, uh, of any strings because it didn't come from the state. Sure. So those are those are really valuable because I think you know if we all if we're working in the grant world we all know about the strings that come attached to money and how hard it can be to fit your project in. So tax credits uh, specifically are something they probably would want to look at. Absolutely. So a few key takeaways here. Um, at first, just from the again on the narrative end, back to the marketing side of things that strategy could be the framework to show your credibility and your capacity in a grant. It shows, hey, we're not just a bunch of guys who want to get together and, and buy this old building downtown because we don't want it demolished. We've got a plan and we've got a plan to fill it. Um, it provides that direction and that purpose. And it also is a great place to compile that data and show that you're going to be continually collecting data um, to, to express interest and, and, and supplement what you're doing as it flows through the, the project cycle. Um, going to incorporate those marketing tactics to um, impress funders with your credibility and show what's in it for them. As, as you mentioned, the jobs, the revenue, the, hey, Pennsylvania or hey, Virginia, you might get X number in tax funding if you allow us to do this. Um, turn it over to you for the other half of the takeaways here. All right. Uh, you know, like we said, you need to make sure your project choice informs your funding search, not the other way around. because it's not just putting the grant together, it's administering the grant funds, filling out all the reports, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the day, the grant process takes up a lot of time. And so you might as well make sure that it's focused on a goal that you've decided is really important to your organization and serves your core mission. You know, you need to invest in a solid proposal. Uh, if that means professional engineers, architects, uh, grant writing consultants, it's worth the money, and a lot of those uh, local sources sometimes can help fund that because they're invested in the in the project. Uh, maybe they can't fund the construction of a hotel, mm -hmm. but they'd be willing to spend or or contribute toward ten thousand dollars to get a real estimate that actually breaks down, you know, quantity, takeoff, and costs mm -hmm. of every item that's going to go into it, so that you can build a good good solid grant application. And then finally, just talk about your project a lot. You're literally, you know, you've created this idea. You've gone after the funding. You are willing it into existence mm -hmm. <laughs> with all your work. So will it into existence with your words? 
Absolutely. Talk about it with everyone, promote your project, uh, you know, show them how committed you are to it. Yeah, we all know that person in our community <laughs> that is constantly talking about something they're working on. And while every once in a while you sit across from a meeting and go, oh my gosh, will you stop? You have to admit they're effective. <laughs> Be that person. That person is getting things done. The other thing that can happen is other groups you'll find might start submitting grant applications or funding applications for their projects and referencing yours. Mm -hmm. And if that starts to happen, especially say they're all going to the state or the county, mm -hmm. it starts to really build this momentum of like, this is serious. This, they're not going to yeah. give up. By funding this, we, we've created a big win situation. Right. They're all, all buying into this and they're all uh, committed to, to go in this direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is great. Um, let's take a few minutes to answer some questions. Um, I will throw one out there based on the number of um, visitors bureaus and, and such that we've got involved. Thoughts on a lot of these organizations are, so feel free to, well, backing up a second, feel free to type your questions into the chat box. We'll read them out. We'll go ahead and, um, and do our best to answer them. And while you're typing up your questions, um, a lot of these visitors bureaus and, and economic development authorities are 501c6s, not 501c3 nonprofits. Thoughts on how to overcome that hurdle. <laughs> and sometimes it can be a hurdle. I mean, there, there's, I know some have a friends group that might be, might be a C3, but, but was, what suggestions do you have on how to deal with, with that? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, one, I would say uh, there is always a way around everything. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, sometimes it does involve getting lawyers or accountants, <laughs> uh, you know, under contract for a little bit to figure out a path forward. Mm -hmm. But if you're, again, you know, you, you could be talking about millions of dollars coming into your organization, um, spending $10,000, say, to get a legal opinion of how to structure an organization might well be worth it. But in the short term, setting that aside, you know, friends groups, mm -hmm. um, heritage areas, County planning agencies, oh, sure. city city planning agencies, those all often can submit for funds on behalf of other groups. Uh, and they honestly, uh, especially the, the, the government ones, maybe want to administer the funds well, and that's, for that's, that's low to yeah. no cost, which sure. may help you in the long term. But it looks like maybe we did get a question. We did. And just, I mean, the other thing to, to shoot off what you just said in terms of partnering with planning office, partnering with other nonprofits even that are C6 or C3s. Yeah. Um, I would think that would build a lot of a lot of credibility and a lot of excitement in that grant narrative as well. But it's not, it's not whatever visitors bureau applying for this grant. It is three organizations that are all partnering on this. I mean that that shows that it's again, it's that that stuff just got real kind of attitude. Right. It's this community wants this. It's not one. It's not one executive director behind their desk. It's 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 a group of people here. Yeah, and that's where it can be helpful too to try and get. It doesn't have to even be your specific project, but something you know. If your county or your your city, your municipality is is writing a uh, comprehensive plan mm -hmm. or maybe a strategic plan. Um, if you're on a Main Street district, uh, Main Streets in Pennsylvania have to do five-year plans that mm -hmm. show specific goals. Get your project listed in there mm -hmm. because not only then can that group apply perhaps for funding, but you can cite that in your application. And when other groups are buying in like that, like you said, it, it shows that momentum that we're all kind of paddling in the same direction. We all believe in this. We all want this. Sure. Absolutely. So Linda's got a question for us. She says, I live in a very rural area and most of our properties do not participate in Smith travel for tracking. We feel we're missing overnight stays because of the lack of lodging. So it's trying to get people to her location and try to show that we need to get people to that location. So what, what source could she use to show that there is a deficit um, of, of lodging or that they need to increase their efforts? Hmm. I mean, there's the obvious sort of hire the consultant and do the overall feasibility study for a hotel, which will show some of not just, oh, hey, you have extra bed shortage, but it'll also show 
how much revenue could be generated in many cases, and even in some cases, give you an idea of where in your area might be the best fit. Yeah. But that, that can sometimes be in that five to 10,000 range easily yeah. for a consultancy to, to do that. Yeah. I mean, I would be happy to give that some more thought. That's a tough question. That's when, a very tough when question. You know, but... When you know you're not capturing everything and how do you get the uh, assemble the data? I mean, I, I've seen some, I've seen some pretty creative solutions. Like I, I've, I've seen, um, uh, people actually spend time going, and these don't rise to the level of quality, perhaps, mm -hmm. but they they speak to something. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, people who have committed to you know driving out to to trailheads and recreation areas, and, and literally uh, making like a spreadsheet of the license plates they found there. Oh wow! Okay, right? Like mm -hmm. if, if you if if you can show. Uh, I mean, let me just be honest. People assume documentation is real, whether it is or not. Okay, so if you have a spreadsheet with mm -hmm. just pages and pages of, you know, I visited this trailhead on this day and there were 24 license plates there mm -hmm. and 10 were from out of state. Sure. And then I went back a week later and there were 16 license plates there and eight were from out of state. Mm -hmm. If you do that for a while, you know, you can start to make a case that, yeah. Hey, I can prove to you that this trail is drawing out of state tourism. So if you've seen Jason hiding in the woods and the bushes <laughs> along a trailhead looking at your car, we know why. So, you know, <laughs> maybe you can adapt something like that to mm -hmm. your, you know, your situation. Sure. Um, kind of think outside the box. Well, and it wouldn't hurt also to check in with the hotels that you do have. Yeah. One of the things before in the in our area, before the um most recent hotel feasibility study was done um, that our, our visitors bureau did was check in with each of the hotels and see sort of what their percentage occupancy was. And they found out um, that there was an 80 to 90, 85 to 90 percent occupancy of the hotel on a regular basis. So that just leads you to believe if 90 percent of the time that hotel is booked, um, chances are there's room for another hotel. So there's, there's yeah. some, a way to generate some of those numbers in a little bit more indirect way. Yeah, another one would be, especially if you're thinking about outdoor recreation, you have that in your community mm -hmm. is, and I'm not super familiar with, you know, how uh, some of the bed tax, like the mechanics of who's counted and who's not mm -hmm. works, but you could check with uh, state parks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, local, local parks, like in, in the county I, I work in a lot, they have a county park that has overnight lodging, both uh, cabins cottages and tent rv mm -hmm. they keep track of where all those visitors come from oh great okay. for their marketing yeah yeah sure you know uh, but by the end of the year that could be six seven eight hundred different uh trips that mm -hmm. you could uh catalog and say you know look i can prove that this campground and this mm -hmm. hotel because they have data you know Sure. What's happening and, you know, kind of extrapolate from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope, I hope Linda, that was um, a couple of just different ideas and opportunities to answer some of your question there. Other questions, anything else that you'd like to know while you have a marketing guy and a grant writer on live camera? Well, we will jump towards not seeing anything at this moment. We will jump towards, um, if anyone's typing final thoughts, we'll jump towards just a quick thank you um, and put Jason's and my information up on the board there. Also, when you receive, again, you will receive um, the recording and the slides for this presentation in an email within the next few days. You'll also receive a link to the Bullman's Marketing Grant Funding Toolkit and you'll receive in the slides, you'll receive both Jason and my contact information if you need anything or have some more specific items you'd like to chat about. So that said, I don't see any other questions popped into our chat window. So I want to thank you so much for joining us and for, for um, hopefully, uh, thank you guys for joining us and hopefully we were able to answer some questions and give you some thoughts for that next grant application that you're working on. So on that note, have a wonderful day and thank you again. Take care.